Ready? My name is Fei Wang, a faculty member in Syracuse Architecture. So it's my pleasure to introduce Rochelle Alten. And she was a, a Richard Blackman visiting critique at Syracuse Architecture in spring 2018. She leads a Modu Architecture in Brooklyn, New York, MODU, uh, with years of experience designing a wide range of project types and scales. She has won Founders Rome Prize in 2016 and numerous other competitions, including those organized by Design Museum Holland, Beijing Architecture Biennale, and the Athens Olympic Games. Design awards include the AIA New Practice New York Award and the Core 77 Award. Before starting her solo practice in 2009, she worked for established architectural practices in both in Tel Aviv and New York. Vitaly holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Technin in Haifa in Israel and a Master in Advanced Architecture Design from Columbia University. She's currently teaching at Columbia University and she has taught at MIT, Pratt Institute, Rock Island School of Design, Cornell University, and University of Pennsylvania. Rutelli Alton is a lead accredited professional in building design and construction. <coughs> so without further ado, please welcome Rutelli Alton. <laughs> It's great to be here and see familiar faces of colleagues and past students. Uh, thank you, Michael Speaks, that made it happen. Uh, and Fei Wang, I hope I said the last name correctly, <laughs> for executing it all. Um, so work, not work, uh, is how we do work uh, in our practice. We have an architecture and design practice in Brooklyn, New York, where I work with my partner, Fu Wang. And work is what you traditionally think about clients based that pay you fees to design their project. And the not work part is uh, uh, research uh, that is based on fellowships and grants that allow us to build a body of knowledge uh, that influence the work part. For us, we see both part as part of the practice, as one entity. Um, those, uh, those uh, fellowship and grant allowed me to live uh, in three cities in the past, live and work in three cities in the past two years. Uh, a year in Rome, three months in Tokyo, and the rest in New York City. Um, I chose to show you this image from the American Academy in Rome. I chose the back room, which is the less official kind of view of, of this institute. Uh, to me, uh, it is one of my favorite rooms, uh, an outdoor room, which allows you to constantly play with the weather and move the furniture and choose where you want to be according to the microclimate and create an, uh, a space that is outdoor. Um, this was a picture from our first day of fellowship in Japan, um, um, thanks to the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts. Uh, this is the International House of Japan. Uh, who host us for a few days. And we went to Japan to uh, research this relationship of uh, indoor and outdoor conditions in the Japanese architecture. Japan has seven different uh, climate zones, and we wanted to research those climate zones in relation to how the architecture transforms between inside and outside and blurs those uh, boundaries. So what makes us human? These are questions, uh, I guess asking questions is part of what makes us human, but it's also part of our practice to ask questions. Um, and we kind of answer it is our ability of our species to, fo to form large groups, uh, large groups that are able to uh, live together in cities. And for us as a species, we look at external conditions, both as environmental conditions and, um, and um, social. So how do we live better? Every question that I think occupies a lot of us, um, and different generations have different responses to that. But it is something that is really important for us to understand. And for us, is the ability to create spaces that allow for social connectivity and connecting, connection to natures. What are natures in plural? Visible and invisible, um, artificial, natural, 
geological and biological, uh, one could say that architecture is itself an extension of nature itself. So human cities and natures. Um, we look at it in different ways, connecting them as, as a first thing in a most literal sense, but in another way designing a kind of a, a cultural awareness that allow us to um, explore social and, and environmental issues that are very uh, important and on the table these days, as, such as climate change. Um, so my partner is uh, Vietnamese, uh, uh, born in Vietnam and raised in the US, and I'm, I was born in Tel Aviv uh, and came to the US 15 years ago. We have completely different logics. Uh, one of us thinks from right to left and writes from right to left, which is myself. So when I explore things, this is how I look at them. And another, sorry, another looks and thinks from left to right. For us, this is a way we work together, finding, oh, sorry, finding this relationship and the nuances between uh, this um, kind of terminology. And this is a lexicon. We have like 80, almost 80 kind of, kind of terms that we develop in an office. These terms are both architectural and environmental and they're connected together as one hybrid. Okay, I have no idea what's front, what's, okay. Here we go, that's better. So I'll start with a movie uh, in Japan. Tokyo. And what interests us in a city as Tokyo and in terms of environmental uh, condition is actually the invisible, um, the gaps between the buildings themselves. The gaps seem insignificant, but they completely radically change and keeps on changing um, Tokyo. Um, they are made by zoning laws to allow, uh, as, a, as a fire barrier, but these gaps um, allow for a building to be independently uh, built and, and unbuilt to get pixelated more and more and it allows air to come through in the city. It is a place of opportunities that is ne a neglected opportunity. Um, and this is kind of one of the glimpses of the things that we've, we've kind of started to do in Japan. Uh, if you look at a series of these, um, sorry, here you go, this is much better the change of color, so the purple is actually where the gap is, and you start to show the city in a different lens, thermodynamic lens, of course, but you also start to show you the invisible qualities of a space and how air can affect both macro, uh, micro and macro conditions in the city. A similar study, a little bit more uh, elaborated, was done in Rome, uh, a walk in the city through piazzas, from one piazza to another, uh, and uh, this is a 10, meter, 10 foot long uh, drawing that actually takes the, uh, um, takes the um, kind of colors of thermodynamic um, camera and translate it into lines. And while you translate this walk in the city between outdoor rooms um, to lines, things start to merge and blur. So architecture, trees, people, objects, gelatos, all started to merge into one thermodynamic entity. Okay. So, okay. so this is a project, not ours. I'm sure you're familiar with the top one. Um, but what we're interested in that picture is actually the smog. And we were invited to uh, um, work on the grounds of the Beijing Olympic uh, after um, it was all over and it became like a, a kind of a, a barren, kind of tabula rasa or barren grounds in the city. And the way we wanted to, to deal with that a specific proposal of ours is to let, take the most uh, smallest element of the city, which is a room, and bring the city into that room. So this is our room. Uh, it's, uh, it's a room with a window. And the window allows, uh, the, window allows the room to become a barometer of, of um, basically pollution in the city at times where 
uh, this kind of data was purposefully or not purposefully not uh, publicly available. Um, so the idea is that your architecture allows you to create this uh, kind of awareness of um, processes in the city. Sorry. And the fabric that we use is both transparent and translucent, so it allows you to, it to mimic exactly the color of the skies at the time that you take the picture, for instance, or you look at it. And in that sense, the smog itself at times becomes, uh, becomes the enclosure of the building. This is a project that we did in Tel Aviv. Uh, the background is Ron Arad Design Museum. Um, and you can see this huge plaza in front of it. Uh, if you've been to, that uh, the, to the Middle East, uh, it's insanely hot and uh, glare um, is very intense and literally it is very difficult place to walk in without almost no shade. So the first thing that we propose as a kind of extension of the museum or a pavilion um, is to provide shade. But a shade that is not a constant shade or shade that changes with the direction of the sun but a shade that actually uses the amazing, beautiful breeze, delicate breeze that comes from the Mediterranean uh, um, waters and flushes the city. In order to do that, we deploy 30,000 uh, PET lightweight balls uh, on a thin mesh. Uh, and this is one scenario that will never repeat itself, so architecture of scenarios creating this um, uh, hung landscape above the city. Um, the structure itself is made from simple uh, greenhouses, which is very dominant. In, in one hand, it's very dominant in the Israeli landscape. In the other hand, it's very, uh, in a way, global structure. And uh, we purposefully did not program the, uh, the, the kind of what people would do uh, beneath it. We just let them be and see what take place. Um, and the idea is that we allow for freedom for both environmental, env environmental properties and people themselves to create this uh, new kind of event. And things starts to happen, uh, you know, one, one little ball can, can, can do magic. So the big challenge with this structure is that it has to be perfectly aligned, otherwise all the balls will swing to one direction. It is made from mesh that allows to rain if it comes to just go through it. Um, and it's purposefully unfinished uh, to allow for the balls to move. Um, so this idea is when architecture is complete. We claim that it is never complete, but it is made a whole when uh, you let the environment and people um, be part of it. I hope someone asked me how the balls don't fall at the end of the lecture. <laughs> so people start to uh, basically walk through the city and uh, let this place be part of their, of their kind of path. Um, some Chairs happen to come there, um, and, every, and sometimes the museum uses it mainly in the afternoons. So how much do you need to program people?
A lot of our work allows for a movement with the winds to let uh, environmental condition have some freedom to uh, uh, create architectural um, kind of spaces. But the structure is always um, as strong as possible, need to, uh, uh, need to be approved by uh, DOB, um, need to be strong for hurricane conditions in Miami, we'll show you a project later. But the idea is, is that a form of resilience or actually can we look at structure that is flexible as a form of resilience? That instead of resisting wind, can it actually allow the wind to move through? So this is one of a series of different uh, tests and uh, projects that we did uh, in our office, but also in, in Sydney with uh, a school of architecture uh, uh, that takes carbon fiber rods uh, and see what their potential as flexible structures. And what's interesting about carbon fibers, it's 10 times stronger than steel and five times lighter. And for us, what was interesting is the idea that it can be very flexible as well. This series has been uh, um, researched uh, also with uh, structural engineers. And this is uh, a very specific model that is very thin of one millimeter rod. But it, now it's being um, tested for actual site condition and it's actually going to be thicker. Uh, but an idea is what is strong right, in architecture. And uh, can you use structure itself to be the performative element in architecture? So this is what we did in, uh, for nine months in um, the American Academy in Rome. This is a map of Italy, if you are able to see a little bit of the pattern of the boots. Uh, and these are 600 construction sites that never been finished. Uh, public construction sites, uh, private ones are not mapped here, but there are thousands of them. Um, um, you can see that it's mainly concentrated in the south, in Sicily. And the idea of them, there's also a minister, a minister of, unconstru con uh, of unfinished construction site, which I'm not sure if it's his interest is actually to ever complete them. Uh, but you can think about them as modern ruin, as found spaces, urban left of, uh, over. Um, disappointments. Uh, spaces without future and spaces without history. They were never ever been used for anything else. There's actually no memory in those spaces. But we like to think about them as weather rooms. And in that sense, we took a different, completely different approach than uh, um, Italian architects who are quite embarrassed by kind of these, these kind of ruins, modern ruins. Um, and when you actually been inside of them, uh, the concrete mass, uh, and you can see the picture on the right from a thermal camera, uh, makes the spaces actually very pleasant. Um, and that's the take we took in it, and the idea of looking at them as potentials. We're going to show you, I'm going to show you a movie taken from Città de la Sport by uh, Calatrava, a project uh, which is... Uh, two stadiums for sport that was um, stopped in middle con mid of construction. Already 200 million euros spent on it, 400 million euros are needed to complete it. And every time we're waiting and waiting, more money is needed to be completed. The question is, do, is it really need to be completed? Um, a bird sanctuary. Indoor land. No 
Roman fountain. Panoramic window. Artificial mountain. A monument without a city. Cloud machine, you can see the cloud coming through. An air quality barometer where the building itself is, it? is here. And every morning you can see from the distance the air quality. So what do you do with these spaces? After visiting so many of them and understanding the economy of these places, you understand that they will never be completed. There's literally not enough money to finish them. So what are their potential of these sites as is? Maybe it's about stop thinking about them as building. Uh, maybe they are plazas, maybe they are piazzas. This specific project is in the outskirts of Milan. Um, it's neither a building, it's neither a building, neither a landscape, it's a merging, it's a merger of all of these. Uh, it was designed by Aldo Rossi. Aldo Rossi was fascinated by ruins, voila, a ruin of his own. Uh, it was supposed to be a train station, but um, the t you can see the train pass, but it will never stop in this station. Um, and what's interesting, if you look at it in kind of just in the perspective of, of environmental kind of lens, then if this is the winter, uh, winter thermal kind of analysis, you can see that because of the sun, it is really low, and the fact that there is no facade, there's a lot of actually um, sun that comes in and penetrates the slab. So. What if we don't complete them? What if we don't use them for 12 months of the year? Uh, they are temporary. How do you design a building uh, that is meant not to be completed? And how is your design is never by itself complete? So the first idea is to literally make it safe and to drop a mesh on top as rail and also to allow the growth that already started to uh, continue the process. And the other idea is, especially when you look at where it is located in places that is outskirts of city, where the economy is actually um, bad, where their uh, unemployment rate is high, so what is a place, what can this place offer to the people who live there? Because they literally need to be able to manage the day-to-day -day operation of a space like that. And how little can you put in to start a spark of life in this building? So this proposal, um, which you see the beginning of it, but we actually developed it later on in, when we were in Japan, is a mini building within a building, um, a different operation of infrastructure line, 20% um, kind of as a minimum to start with that allows for heat and water and cool uh, air and kind of uh, kind of the basic of our needs to 
to operate in these spaces. And this specific kind of um, strategy of roof is a contra contra contrary to the gable roof. So if the gable roof keeps the circulation of the air to be in an interior condition, inverting that scheme allows for the, the air or to pollute outwards. So if you consider these as um, heating sources, then it starts to pollute the barrier beyond the wall itself. And the gap between this insertion and the actual building becomes um, a piazza. And it kind of pollutes the air and creates spaces with different thermodynamic qualities. So these colors represent this idea that you can come there in the morning and create different opportunities and different uh, places for you to work, uh, work and learn. And you can find it both in a, most, in a, in a sense of social space and also in a, in a sense of a thermodynamic sense. So you can choose where you're most comfortable in that specific moment. Another in insertion is room of doors where the doors themselves can be closed or open and work with the different weather conditions outdoors if you will want to have the uh, wind come through and the breeze come to come through you allow it or not uh, multi-stage a space that boasts uh, a roof that also allow you to um, collect water but um, these platforms um, uh, could keep change and allow for different congregation of social kind of situations um, and activities. You can see it here. And Tower of Air, which is proposed in, in holes that started to happen in the structure itself, um, where uh, you can actually create individual seating and instead of heating the air, you can actually heat or cool the chair itself which uh, saves a lot of energy. So this is a proposal of an open building. Of course, it needs to be in the right climate. It needs to work in a temporary kind of uh, context. But the con temporary context also allows it for flexibility with different uh, building codes. And how do we bring it back to the US? Um, this is the way um, creating a team uh, from different professions, some landscape designer and social uh, activists, architects, and and and, um, and even um, uh, uh, climate scientists to be able to push these ideas back into uh, the landscape of the U.S. of uh, cities across the U.S. with empty lots and abandoned spaces, and we are starting our adventure in Newburgh. Um, in upstate New York. Okay, I have to get some. Sorry. Another abandoned site in the U.S. Um, um, basically, uh, load. Um, let me check. A shipbuilding factory with its own uh, uh, dock loading bo um, dock uh, in Connecticut uh, with a client that wants it all. He wants uh, manufacturing, education, exhibition and office programs. Um, the scale of the space, this is the same space kind of a before and after kind of image, is roughly uh, as like the Tate Museum. Um, it's enormous in space and the question is, the first question is how you even um, heat or cool it. It's a massive space. Um, so that's one question. So you would, do, you would need to divide it into kind of segments that are able to be more uh, climately controlled. On the other hand, when you do that, you create separation between different people who are using this facility. So what kind of device allows you to do both? Uh, before we show you this kind of short movie, this is a language that we develop in our office that it's in between architecture drawing and a sketch. And it basically shows you the invisible properties of a space. So these are the weather conditions that we imagine or weather scenarios that happens in a space. This is a clean room, nothing happens in this one. It's just, it just, uh, stays the same. 
and um, for instance this code of uh, kind of hashtag is literally um, a device that we've been um, using which are industrial air curtains and these industrial air curtains um, are able to allow you to visually connect to other programs, other people in a, in a site um, but it also separates climatic environments. So when you design next to the water, you can just end up in the uh, barrier of the building facade and the idea is to ha penetrate as much as possible from the existing concrete slab to allow for water to drain and this water becomes islands of people that can sit there and create this new relationship with the nature so it's not just about uh, drainage but it's also creating space for the people who work there for having lunch, enjoying, enjoying the sun. Okay. This is another exhibition that we were part of in Rome, a 40 foot long um, model, a city, a radical city, a city uh, that has no buildings. It, it's a clash between the urban scale and the interiors. It may seem very radical for you, but it actually happens to you every day in the cyber world. So you're all connecting from one bedroom to another, if you think about the city in that way. And the city have different properties. One of the devices are forms of density, right? So with the density, it allows for different uh, uh, ways of the wind to go through and different microclimates. And ideas, uh, and ideas about this kind of dwelling started with, with the Roman uh, house, the domus, where you actually didn't have a designated room for sleeping. You could sleep in the kitchen, you can sleep in the roof, you can sleep in a, in a bedroom, you can sleep alone and you can sleep with others. It's a social act or not. Um, and this idea of multiplicity and different options in this, in this specific scenario are taken. So it allows you for multiple conditions to, to bathe, uh, to sleep, to, to cook. Um, and you don't necessarily understand the scale. Is this an avenue in a city? Is this a corridor? It is um, a house or it is a piazza. Those boundaries are blurred. We didn't do it alone. We worked in a couple of collaborations, which is part of the amazing part of the academy. So we worked with the um, climate scientists who actually calculated how much pollution will the city ta uh, um, uh, take. And this kind of black ice is actually um, measured of that kind of scale pollution. We worked with uh, two authors, and I'll show you the movie they imagined. They wrote text on how they imagined the city experience to be. And we worked with a composer that took their words and that they wrote and turned them into environmental sounds. The snow was coming down hard, erasing the city. On West End, just outside the Apelles, the wind was whipping a no parking sign like a fighter getting work. The snow, the snow did not twinkle or float. The city. It crashed the snow was coming down hard. The, the storm rested in the arms of the earth. On West End, just outside the Apelles, the, 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 the wind was whipping a no parking sign. It silenced the mechanical thrum of the city. The grating metal. The snow was coming down the incessant. Most of the 
The last project for today is actually the first project that my partner and I started to collaborate together and I'll start with the end. So this is the second life of the project. It was deployed in the water of Florida to create an uh, artificial uh, uh, reef for fish. This is one of our favorite clients and uh, someone goes to visit the health of the reef once a year so we can get updated pictures. So this project was designed for both scenarios, both the human and the extra small, uh, the fish. If anyone wants the coordinates, I can give it to you. <laughs> Um, start with the movie. It was uh, created for Art Basel in Miami Beach. Uh, it was the open kind of um, kind of um, kind of open space that was created. Seven miles of rope moving with the wind. It was designed in uh, to hold hurricane conditions, and if we were to use resistive material, it would cost a fortune. So the idea of the rope is to let 90% of the wind through. Every day that you come in, the wind conditions are different and create different experience, allowing the people to come again and again and experience a space completely different. Um, light connected to wind created different uh, lighting experiences. Different types of ropes, both reflective, both phosphorescent allowing for multi-sensorial experience. Um, five cities were part participating, five artists for five cities were participating in this. Each night, a different city uh, celebrating their art, and the artists chose where they want to hang out, where they want to perform. Some chose the sand. Furniture was the most lightweight furniture we can find that you can literally hold with one hand and move it around. Curated by uh, Time uh, Creative Time, a very important art organization in New York City. Time with hurricane uh, hurricane conditions. Um, that was the design proposal. Um, and the fish was not necessarily the first client kind of interest. Um, it would have to be done in different ways, for instance, to convince the client that he really needs a lot of holes in the um, con concrete footings uh, for um, wiring of sorts, but it allowed for a really awesome home in the future for some <laughs> crabs. <laughs> Are you getting hungry? <laughs> um, and at the end of the day, it's all about people and engagement of people when you create architecture that is whole. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Oh, oh, so many. Start from here. Hi. Uh, I'm really interested about uh, what you talk about the combination of human nature and uh, city. And I'm also interested about the term you said about the urban uh, inter urban interior. And you also talk about the uh, indoor city. I think these two terms are so interesting, yeah. like opposite, opposite sides, but how can we understand these two? One is the uh, urban, indoor, and one is the uh, indoor cities, really. So for me, it's fascinating, but I, I'm not so, uh, I cannot get the fully understanding on this. Um, you asked a lot, so I'll concentrate with the indoor city. Is that yeah. real, these terms? Yeah. yeah. Right? I think it w when you deal with contradicting terms, then you really start to extract the interest in each one of them. And um, 
you can think about architecture and what is architecture, I think traditionally we were all thought that it's a shelter, right, from the city, a, a shelter from nature, um, which immediately you think about a boundary that is a clear boundary. But if you think of archi uh, it as architecture as an extension of nature, then the boundaries are getting blurred. Um, and in that sense, when you can think about a room in a city, and a city together, you can think about, you rethink about this relationship. And as you've seen, we tackle hundreds of buildings that are open. There is no facade, right? They are not building per se, but what are their potential? So if you rethink or rewire your brain, or can these two contradictions exist? Actually, they exist all the time. You're emailing each other, you're texting each other from very interior parts, and you're Instagramming it, right? So that idea of inside and, and, and private and, and public is, is already part of your lives. Yep. <laughs> um, you have to have, um, I'm not to show you a picture, but it is a uh, very important details, and I really, rec um, a kind of detail are important as a to conceptual design, but there are, uh, it's one layer, it's not two layers, the glass, uh, the balls are not uh, layered between. Uh, we calculated that they will never have enough uh, wind load that will push them um, upwards. Um, and there are plexiglass, whole plexiglass kind of panels on the side, so you are not seeing them in kind of that perspective. It depends on the wind. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, when you guys designed the roof, with like, with the balls moving, were there any specific programs? Did you like design it with any specific program associated with it, like in mind, possible programs? Well, I know architects really want to program everything, or in that sense, create a, a control of the users and what are the possibilities. And it's the first project that we ever done that we decided not to do that. The idea of the scenarios is happening on the roof, and then people underneath have multiple possibilities to engage with it. And, and you see, life starts to happen on its own, and it was actually interesting not to program it. More questions? I think I, um, well, I, I hope I kind of explained it, but the idea that architecture is not complete without people and environment um, engage, engaging together. I just came back for three months from Japan. <laughs> so the inspiration there for this condition is uh, infinite. So if you think about the Shima Art Museum by Nishizawa, where you can imagine that during the day, uh, it is open building, uh, the most uh, flat dome currently exists, but if you can imagine that people are using the museum from 8 to 5, and what other animals are using that building from 5 to 7.59, right? So, um, the idea that we don't know is actually kind of exciting, right? You can think about it. Um, so, environment, there are different ways of interpreting it, right? From a wolf to uh, clouds to a breeze to smell, to dust, to pollution. Yeah, you have to use the microphone. I just noticed something very interesting. Just now, when, when someone asked a question without the microphone, here, it's outside, somewhere. If it's indoor, it's outdoor. Then it's <laughs> away from the microphone or something. This is very interesting. Yeah, I just want to know that um, once you've created these projects, did you ever um, 
ha ever have the feeling that you wanted to inclu include ideas from one project back to another? Because there were so many interesting ideas like that air barrier, and then I was thinking of how you could add that into the city, and have you ever thought, gone back to a project and be like, oh, I could have used this there, and then ever compared ideas between two projects? It's, yeah, it's a dangerous path. Um, I think from every project you do, you take with you the things that worked and things that work less and implement it in the next project. So go back to the project you did and refer to the modern ruin you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Did you see a potential in every abandoned building? like you visited, or is there like any particular criteria when you want to make the building like reborn again? Uh, we visited many buildings. Uh, we were naive at the beginning and thought that we would get permits to visit and approvals, but that never, showed, never happened in Italian uh, bureaucracy. So instead we started to hop the fence um, and we visited um, dozens of them and they are categorized. Um, but uh, the ones that, that we are most attracted to are the ones that you are reasonably safe, um, located in climatic zones that allow for open building kind of ideas, and can be supported from the local communities because it needs a hands-on uh, management. <laughs> um, seeing as the idea of an unfinished building is quite like unconventional, like um, is there any like are there any like limitations or like rules like set aside by you or like the client that you have to like follow um, going forward with like the projects and things? Um. Just for example, in Newburgh, there's a lot of um, sites that, if you think about the funding, we can only get funding for preserving them. But then you ask the question, why do we preserve them? They don't have any necessarily interesting characteristics. But what is actually interesting in them is that there is actually a tree growing inside and a window that started to happen naturally through bricks falling. <laughs> um, so what do you preserve as, as an interest to get the funding to keep this building alive. Uh, is that answer your question? Uh, in terms of why is it uh, makes, to me it makes sense, okay, in the way I look at it. <laughs> so I would like to preserve the tree and I would like to preserve the window that happened on its own because for me that's the most exciting part of the, of, of the, design, of, of the architecture of the space. Um, for the Radical City idea, how would you uh, deal with the idea of privacy? Because everything is so open. It's radical for a reason. Um, you do push the boundaries when you propose things like that in a, in a model or a, a theoretical proposal. Uh, purposefully so, provocative. As I discussed, it happens in your lives more than mine because of generation difference in how you use technology. Um, and uh, in a way, it's, it's not as, as far as you would think as uh, co-sharing of living and working starts to happen. Um, so why not connect it even more in a provocative way? <laughs> more questions? Final one? Yeah, we never had so many questions. I'm <laughs> so happy. Thank you. Final one? Great. Thank you. Thank you.